Thanks. You, thank you so much for the honor of an invitation. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to talk about uh, the issues of generative artificial intelligence in education and what we need to figure out about that. So I'm sure many of us uh, were hit by this big train that disrupted lots of our conversations early November uh, last year. Generative artificial intelligence became something that is relatively somehow almost a home word for, for most of people. Made me a popular dad in the playground when basically everybody wanted to understand what I'm now doing. And only like six or seven months before that, nobody would really care what I would say that I'm a professor who is looking into artificial intelligence and in education. So the whole point of generative artificial intelligence is to really try to generate data based on the understanding and the analysis of large amounts of other data that are available on the web that are scraped and then they are analyzed for understanding of different types of patterns that can then based on these analysis reproduce different types of textual data visual data as well as different types of images source code for programming and so on so this obviously created a lots of debate especially in the broader spectrum lots of big claims that artificial intelligence is going to claim all of a sudden all the jobs that artificial intelligence is basically doing so many powerful things that we can't really keep up with many of these type of things many organizations as well around the world uh, try to create certain recommendation documents recently the u.s uh, office for education of technologies provided a document that offers the uh, recommendations and insights for the use of artificial intelligence in learning and teaching. And they are not just looking to higher education, but they are also looking to uh, K-12. And I was also pleased to have participated in one of their listening sessions since the speaker on the panel they had dedicated specifically to assessment and artificial intelligence. Similarly, UNESCO also published their document that is uh, containing also a fair bit of uh, suggestions and recommendations about the use of artificial intelligence in higher education in particular, which is a quite useful resource. And I know many different organizations around the world are preparing uh, also their similar types of documents. In today's talk, I'm going to cover three main things. I want to talk about the main promise of artificial intelligence in education, specifically focusing on generative artificial intelligence. I want to also talk about certain concerns because these type of technologies are not coming without any baggage. And I want to also talk about what actually need we need uh, we need to address before we can effectively use some of these technologies in the future. I also like to give you immediately everything that I've got. So the first three th takeaways and the key points you will get from my talk. So if I bore you in 10 minutes or time or you will need to go, you'll have something uh, out of my talk. So the number one point is that there's huge amount of promise of these technologies in terms of guiding students, in terms of offering additional teaching support, in terms of also assessment and feedback. There's obviously lots of concern as well about the reliability and trustworthiness of generative artificial intelligence. There's huge amount of issues related to bias of these technologies. And also, we are not quite certain what are the workload implications of these type of technologies in spite of the promise of lots of productivity uh, improvements. And finally, with respect to the ethics as well, we don't know really how far our informed consent goes with these type of technologies. And the final point is, and we're going to be talking about these needs, is that we really need to go away from the commentary space and lots of opinion space to generating robust evidence in terms of what works, what doesn't work, and how we can actually effectively make strong claims that certain things are working well in learning and teaching and beyond that. So we can now dive in into all these three key points. So talking about the promise, we recently looked into the over existing literature in the use of these so-called large language models that are mostly underpinning generative artificial intelligence. They are underpinning ChatGPT. They're typically called generative pre-trained transformer technologies. They are trying to identify generally the patterns in the data. They are typically predicting the next plausible 
sequence of the words. And consequently, also how the sequences of the words can be also correlated most effectively with the sequences of certain types of images and the fragments of the different types of videos. So we identified a range of different themes that are emerging inside of that literature. I'm going to specifically talk about four of them. One of them is that uh, large language models are really promising to be used for guiding students and tutoring in many aspects. Probably many of you heard of Khan Academy. Khan Academy is a really useful organization that is providing many helpful resources online, mostly for K-12 education, but beyond. They're also used by many teachers, many educators. They're also used even in higher education to a certain extent. Khan Academy, they developed Camigo. Camigo is this chatbot that is built upon generative artificial intelligence, specifically technology which is also released by OpenAI, the vendor of ChatGPT. It's called GPT-4. Camigo is featured in many of their existing materials as something that can provide students with the guidance on certain type of topics. When students try to ask Camigo to give them the answers or to spit out the whole essay, Camigo actually gives them uh, moves, guiding moves, that is trying to prompt them to engage into much more deeper understanding of the topics. Camigo is also uh, supporting more kind of types of moves that is promoting creativity of the learners. This is one really interesting uh, promise. The other promise is also that Generative artificial intelligence can generate source code for programming as well. But what is useful in that exercise is that you can ask GPT technologies is to explain that code. It can be used for guiding the learners in many situations. It can also help them debug the code and understand different deficiencies that they had inside of it. And it also is allowing not only to do the same type of explanations with the source code, but also in solving mathematical problems. So offers some interesting promise there. It's also useful for content generation and supporting educational designers in education. So when we talk about that, this is one example that is generated by colleague Anisha Bakaria with the University of Queensland, in which the educational designers can use very relatively simple types of prompts to ask ChatGPT not only to provide them with the potential learning outcomes that could be used in the design of a course in higher education, but it can also provide them with the suggestions of the resources that can be incorporated inside of it. And moreover, it can also generate the entire web content for that in a web type of a language that is immediately deployable to be used directly live. The other thing is I've been talking to lots of psychometricians recently, uh, some of them that are producing these high stake assessments in Australia, in different states. They love these generative AI technologies because it allows them to generate at very rapid speed lots of items that could be used for their assessments that are then later propagated for additional reliability and validity assessments before they are actually deployed in the actual assessments. There's also another thing we've been studying a lot in our group at Monash, and that's the automated feedback. So we recently published a study in which we use GPT, uh, chat GPT, and also replicating that study as well with the use of GPT-4. And the study demonstrated that in comparison to the human tutors, ChatGPT can generate much more readable feedback for the students as perceived by the students and much more elaborate feedback. Well, typically human tutors are much more busy and not as generous with the words as GPT or ChatGPT can be. That's number one. However, there's not necessarily perfect agreement between humans and the machines in terms of when the tutors are finding something, human tutors are finding that is actually negative part of the essay or the written document that GPT can find it positive. So we still don't know and we haven't done and there's no sufficient understanding why we are having some of these disagreements, but could be in many cases that 
generative AI can complement human tutors and human assessor assessors to generate some additional perspectives that they miss out as they are providing their assessments. And the final important thing is that not only does ChatGPT offer insights and the feedback that is providing whether something is correct or not, but offering students even some additional guidance, offers feedback on the process and the levels of self-regulation and can give them even additional prompts what they can study in the future, which is really a promising thing. I think, again, I pressed the wrong button. Sorry. I realize the bug is not the technology. So thanks so much. Uh, we also create this environment, which we call Flora, and it's been used for us as an extension of the existing learning management systems and even an extension of the browsers, which allows students to uh, uh, really develop their skills for self-regulated learning when they are working on information problem-solving tasks. In these situations, students are supposed to find a range of different online resources, analyze them, interact with them. We also offer them different facilities to plan their learning, different types of checklists, also highlights, and taking different types of annotations and the notes. But then also we offer them with the writing tools. And this is one of these writing tools that is now enhanced also with generative AI. And generative AI is in this particular example used to assess students' quality of the integration of the information sources that they are, that are trying to work with. And that particular type of assessment is then putting back to the students what is high level, mid level, or low level integration, which is really, in our case, grounded in Bloom's taxonomy. We have similar types of tools that are supporting students' writing in terms of the grammar, we are supporting students in terms of uh, legal writing. So we work with our school of law that is actually providing different types of rhetorical moves. We also work with other different countries as well in different languages that are supporting the use of um, these type of technologies to scaffold students to write entrance essays for higher education and improve their uh, overall writing and many other types of examples. So this is one thing. The final thing I want to talk about, which is actually discussed the most with respect to generative artificial intelligence, and that's the assessment. And I'm not going to talk it about the threats to the assessments. I'm going to talk it about the promise of generative artificial intelligence to help us to deal with certain things in assessment. Last year, we had this paper in which we outlined different prospects, how artificial intelligence can transform our assessment. We said that lots of assessments are not done as frequently or as well because they are quite onerous on the teaching staff or teachers in schools. And what generative artificial intelligence can offer us, it can actually offer us lots of feasible assessment. I just talked about lots of these type of assessments. It can be on the formative level and then summative as well. There's plenty of the automated, automated scoring type of things that are talking about automated scoring of the essays and automated scoring of students short or long responses to different things that are typically fairly reliable with respect to the humans with the agreement with typically 80 to 95% of the uh, accuracy. We also talk a lot about having the need to have continual assessment rather than the assessment at just one point in time. And we want to basically have, and I will show some specific examples about that. Adaptive assessment is something that's been around for quite some time, and probably some of you heard of adaptive computerized testing, which is really trying to provide adaptive tests to the students' types of skills as well, and then try to drill down deeper into what students know or not know to discriminate in the different levels of the uh, understanding. Authentic assessment is really we are striving to. We want to have our professional assessment to be in authentic assessments. We work a lot in our group with nursing students at Monash University, where we are actually looking them in the simulation-based environments in which they are fairly distracted by, for example, actors that are representing um, certain malicious uh, relatives of the patients that are in the ward or unhelpful physicians that are coming also to disrupt their work. And we are using some of these technologies to assess their teamwork and the overall performance of the teamwork. And then we also want to think about what is the modern assessment? What are the skills we need as part of the process? I'm going to drill into these 
particular two ones, the continuous assessment and the modern assessment. Many actually probably saw the debate that we are currently just focusing on the final product of the assessment. And that final product is like a written essay and something else. And then there are debates that we should transition to the process assessment, thinking about how students came to the final product, how they came to that uh, conclusion that they reached in some of their written products. So the idea for us, and I was talking previously about this environment, we were also working on this, that we are using very generous type of data collection points. That's where we are seeing the use of learning analytics coming into the play. Any clicks students make is collected. Any mouse movements is collected. Any interactions students have with ChatGPT, and we embed it in our environment, ChatGPT. Students can ask ChatGPT to give them feedback and guidance how they can potentially improve their written essay so far. We, with this very simple prompt for the students, behind the scenes are sending the entire essay draft as well as some relevant content as well students are supposed to be writing so that we can fine tune ChatGPT to provide them with guidance. And in many cases that guidance is meaningful, but we also collect that data. And then what do we do with that data is we are actually mapping these interactions with particular types of tools into the meaningful cognitive and metacognitive processes. So we can understand when students are planning their learning, when students are reading, when students are elaborating or organizing some information. And then based on that, we can actually draw lots of inferences about their process. This is one of our recent studies in which we showed that these green bars that are representing the amounts of time students are engaging into different types of processes are actually explaining much more variance in the outputs of the essay scores of the students than just the quality of the written product. And we even have some additional types of uh, assessment techniques that are mapping now these processes in so-called latent variable space in which we can do relatively robust psychometric assessments of the student processes. So in a way, what I'm trying to communicate with this is that the assessment should not come just with the final product that students submit to, but also with the whole process based on which we can actually let the students know how they can improve their learning rather than just the products of their learning. And the final thing is also how modern skills students need to use. We published a recent study in one of, uh, it's the only school at Monash University that is top number one in the world. And their students are asked to write their reflections annually. And uh, we then asked, we basically manually uh, got the scores of these reflections according to the rubrics that is used by that school. And then we asked ChatGPT with nine different prompting strategies that are documented in the literature. ChatGPT beat students so badly. It became almost a reputational challenge, right? But then the question is, is our assessment good? Should we not be assessing these students on something deeper, something that the machine cannot really produce? How it's possible that assessment should be something innate, something very personal, something that is reflecting on the personal experience can actually beat on the rubrics. Perhaps our rubrics are not good enough and where learners are supposed to be going. Concerns. First one is that generative AI techniques are really not flawless. I love this book. It's been published about five years ago now. Predicted everything that we will see. Not because uh, these guys uh, are actually negative about AI. They are actually AI researchers, but they know also really well these technologies. AI, in terms of the generative AI, has no reasoning and planning ability, has no sense of truthfulness whatsoever, has no ability to make any causal inferences. Have a six-year-old at home, and when she was one, you would actually see if she hits some wall or something, she needed to do that only once. She would never do it again. Generative AI to be actually reliable to do some of these things need to hit that wall millions and millions of times, right? And so that's a really potential issue. Has no common sense. It's not part of it. It's the predicting next sequence of the tokens, that is to say sequence of words. 
The second concern is with respect to the workload. Everybody is talking about this great aspiration. AI is going to increase our productivity, which is fine, right? But then there was this really interesting article that sparked lots of thought uh, in my mind as well. And one of the things that he mentioned as well in this uh, commentary was email. It's a great thing to increase our productivity co to communicate with other people. But my goodness, it's killing my workload. Every email I get comes with a task. Email becomes your workload or workflow management system. And so this type of a technology, we don't know how it's going to increase also our workload or not. We've seen also the technologies such as tools for uh, plagiarism detection. They're increasing our workload. They're not decreasing because you every time need to pass our students' essays through that. And then whenever you are potentially overriding the whatever the technology tell, you need to explain yourselves. So we don't know what are the implications of these type of technologies as well on our productivity. We did a systematic interview a couple of years ago as well that looked how automatic feedback students are, automatic feedback systems are affecting learning and teaching. In terms of learning, they can be really helpful to increase students' performance. But then in terms of the teaching workload, we had no evidence in the literature that is decreasing teachers' uh, workload. One of the explanations is because they have to actually work the way of these technologies into our educational designs. And also we need to then create additional types of activities that are building upon that automatic feedback that is provided there. So there is no guarantee that these type of technologies are going to increase our efficiencies in education. Ethics is quite an unavoidable topic when it comes down to artificial intelligence or the day. Earlier this year, there was this publication in which they analyzed AI to, to be used for automatic scoring of long and short uh, ans ad answers of the students, written ones. What I found is basically two, a few important things. One is that these automatic technologies can actually have negative experience, negative effect on students' experience. They can actually just put off students in many situations and students may not be so motivated to do it. They suggested two key points is that many of these automated decisions should actually be deferred to the human tutors or human individuals. And the other one is also whenever we are automatically labeling or scoring some of these messages or essays, they need to be uh, labeled as such that is coming and it was automatically done rather than it's done by the humans to mitigate the adversarial effect of some of these automated technologies. The other important thing is with respect to the informed consent. We don't know, first of all, with JetGPT, how and what are the actual terms of use. We don't know if all our prompts and our information, whatever you are entering, your essay, etc., is going to be stored and then used for the training of these type of technologies. If it's used for training of these type of technologies, then unlearning then becomes hard. In the same way as it is for us to unlearn certain things. You know, sometimes you see something you are not supposed to be seeing, and then you may be in trouble for that because you don't you cannot unlearn it. It's similar for these type of technologies. There's an area of machine learning which is called continual learning, but it's still in the early days, and there's no inexpensive way to actually unlearn certain things. Due to this issue, Italy decided to ban ChatGPT for a limited period of time and they, until they, at least in their jurisdiction, got sufficient reassurances that these issues will be addressed. Also, large language models are built primarily on these kind of publicly available resources. They are available, uh, such as Wikipedia. But here's Wikipedia. Where are the major authors of Wikipedia? They're primarily from Western countries, predominantly US. And then with respect to the distribution of the people, men, predominantly white men, like myself, are actually contributing to Wikipedia. So then don't trust my judgment as well about some of these things, please. So it's really important to kind of understand that inherent bias that is inside of that. It's also with respect to the equity. English is dominating this. Chinese, well, that is to say Mandarin, is then only second. But we know in terms of who is 
that there are so many more people for whom Chinese is the first language in comparison to English to be the first language for them, although English is this international lingua franca that is used across the people. And then final thing is that all these technologies have lots of that bias that is then surfacing. This is a simple uh, prompt that is used on this tool that is using to generate images based on the textual prompts. And the prompts were basically patriotic dog superhero. It has to be very masculine because that's the masculine bias that is inside of these technologies. And also fairly Americanized version of a superhero, mostly through the Marvel that is dominating also the discourse that is out there. So we need to be aware when we say creativity, what kind of creativity and whose creativity is actually being promoted and whose cultural creativity is promoted inside of these technologies. The final thing I'm going to talk about is the needs, what we don't understand at this stage and what we need to really work on. The first one is that we need to develop and measure AI literacy. And we don't know so much how to do it at this stage. So you may ask, well, why AI literacy is important? I think that's fairly obvious, but just a couple of uh, arguments for that. Number one argument is that there was a recent uh, report by OpenAI together with the University of Pennsylvania and Open Research in which they analyze the register of the jobs, the types of jobs that are available or registered in the US, about a bit over a thousand jobs. And they analyze then each task for each of these jobs and its potential exposure to large language models. They found that about 80% of the jobs will have at least 20% of the exposure to AI and about 18, about 19% 19 of these jobs as well will have about 50% and beyond, beyond that exposure to AI. These 19% are mostly in the writing industries, uh, software engineering industries, etc. They're very clear with a caveat that doesn't mean that these jobs will be automated, nor does it mean even that some of these tasks will be fully just given to the machines. There are many things that will actually influence why, when and why we are doing some of these things. There's a really interesting example that happened in the legal system in the US. There was this lawyer who was representing, defending an airline, which was accused for whatever reasons. I forgot about the reasons. But then the lawyer submitted the court filings by using ChatGPT and got in trouble because prosecution realized that all the cases that were cited in those filings were non-existent. They could not find them. Then they asked the judge to contact the defense to actually explain it and produce these cases. And then the lawyer for defense said, I cannot. I just basically use ChatGPT, right? And the judge found the lawyer in contempt of court and got fined because they were acting in bad faith. I don't think they were acting in bad faith, they were incompetent. It was basically sheer incompetence in this particular case. But that tells us that we cannot thoughtlessly use these type of technologies. We need to have certain types of skills. One possible conceptualization that came up is to kind of try to map out some of these AI literacy skills across the Bloom Bloom's taxonomy. But this conceptualization is fairly engineering folk requires for you to learn some of these underpinning algorithms and almost create your own systems. And I don't think that this type of conceptualization is actually quite helpful for, for the broader public. What we need is actually to look what are those angles as well. What are type of cognitive, humanistic, as well as social types of skills that are needed. Inside of these technologies, we need to think about what does it mean problem solving? It's a hybrid form of human AI collaborative problem solving in many situations. Also, when we are thinking about human self-regulation in terms of self-regulated learning as well, the role of that hybrid AI human regulation when it comes down to learning, that's basically from the cognitive side. From the humanistic side as well is what are the actual human values that we want to see in these type of technologies and how we are then judging these technologies when we are using them and how people can see these technologies. 
And also, what is the level of the human control over these type of technologies? There is this uh, work in humans computer interaction in the book by Ben Schneiderman published last year on human-centered AI, which posits that the highest degree of safety, reliability, and trustworthiness of AI systems comes when there's high degree of automation and high degree of human control. And so I think that's really important to notice. And the final thing is this social component, because lots of our social interaction will be mediated by some of these AI technologies, sending emails, sending messages, etc. So what does it mean? What kind of skills do we need to have in that type of dialogue? So that really is just the, having this implication that we need to redefine the conceptualization of the skills that we will probably need to assess. So in terms of the collaborative problem solving, self-regulated learning, creativity, and many other types of skills. And the final thing I wanna talk about today is understanding impact on learning. There's lots of basically things that I said it's promising. But I also want to emphasize one thing, that in terms of human cognition and metacognition, fluency of the confident outputs that generative AI technologies can produce is not necessarily best. Because when we see something that is looking very fluent, it's much harder for us to detect certain discrepancies inside of that, in, inside of whatever it's produced there. There's famous mathematician at UCLA who was a, a PhD at age 20 who said that when you produce something with these types of technologies, it makes it much harder to find the deficiencies because we cannot depend anymore on these kind of shallow type of features as well of the text based on which we can detect some of the issues. So it makes me wonder if this type of technologies will produce something I call lazy metacognition. The sense-making paradox is when we are asked to produce written outputs on the information that we need to find about the topics we have no prior knowledge. It's called sense-making paradox. If ChatGPT spits out so confidently certain information on a topic we have no prior knowledge, what does it mean for our sense-making? What does it mean for our, for our information-seeking process in our judgments? I think we need to figure that out. The other important thing is Writing is a very useful learning tool. Promotes that innate dialogue that you have with yourself. Helps you to identify limitations in your thinking. Help you identify inconsistencies that you have in your thinking. But if that's basically offloaded to the machine, what does it mean for learning? Is it maybe detrimental for our learning? We really need to figure that out and there's no existing evidence we can build upon. And the final thing is we know from the literature as well, that people, learners, are not good at asking high quality questions. So if we are not good at asking high quality questions, then how can we prompt these type of technologies to produce useful outputs? I'm a trained computer scientist and we've been all through often kind of targeted, our jobs will be offloaded and then that means really that people who are creating these type of software artifacts with the ChatGPT can actually have very good questions and when they very really targeted requirements, what exactly what they need. Some software engineers say, good, we are in business because people are not generally so good at doing these type of things. So a couple of final remarks. I hope that I really convinced you I made an argument today that we need to broaden our understanding of learning with about and despite generative artificial intelligence. And the final point is really that AI is unlikely to go away. It's going to stay. But we need to lead the change of the process. We in higher education and broader education sector. And if you are interested in participating in some of these broader discussions, I'd like to uh, ask you to pay attention to GRAIL, which is the Global Research Alliance. Uh, for artificial intelligence in education and learning. And I'm right on time. Open for your questions. There's a question there. I thank you for the interesting talk. 
Um, I know some universities are using ChatGPT as a learning tool. So giving it to students to um, appraise or critique to find problems with it. But if AI is getting smarter, will that be no longer useful? That's a really, really good question. What you are asking. I think AI is getting smarter on some level. The AI is not getting smarter on another level. The fundamental way how it's constructed, the current generation of AI, generative AI, does not will not be able ever to completely solve the problem of tr uh, uh, trustworthiness and reliability of the information. Simply because the task that is solving is prediction of the next sequence of words. So there's no underlying grounding into what, what is potentially reliable or not to be indicated in a particular case. So if you train it with lots of different types of biased type of information, then it'll actually be spitting out that information as well. And we can actually try to have some of these guardrails over it, but they are also, again, trying to do the same thing to train that technology. But if you use a bit more like positive psychology with this type of technologies, we can also bypass that. So that's basically one of these important things to do. My view is that that kind of thing, and there was recent, I think, uh, exercise done at the University of Virginia where they tried students to use it, and almost every single uh, student found hallucinations inside of these technologies. So I don't think that some of these things will be quickly solved. Probably requires multiple years of very fundamental research before we actually find potential solutions for some of these technologies. And I anticipate even in the foreseeable future, we'll start gradually start to see hitting the wall as well. There's lots of also recently claims that, for example, there was a claim 10 days ago uh, that uh, uh, ChatGPT or generative AI can ace MIT uh, electrical engineering and computer science uh, exams. And then students, senior students, year four at MIT were actually quite uh, uncomfortable with that claim. And then they decided to replicate that study that was done before that by their professors. And they found that the study was not methodologically robust at all. And ChatGPT cannot ace MIT exams at all. It cannot even pass them. So we really kind of need to be very kind of um, cautious about what we believe, what these technologies can or cannot do, and also what is the uh, robustness of the methodologies based on which some of these claims are made. Okay, I've got one. Um, it's a kind of a technical question. Um, you said earlier that GPT-4 is still learning, and what what I want to ask is, well, when our students are using GPT, for instance, they will ask it um, ill-written questions and the answers that come back then the students tend to accept straight away. And therefore, is GPT looking at the way it's answered those questions and because it's not getting the second or a third question, is it reinforcing its own model, thinking it's already given the correct question and that inherently then is going to put bias in that system, which lowers, if you like, the quality of the answers that GPT is giving. That's a really terrific question. We don't know the inner workings of the chat GPT itself. It's not disclosed. It's the ironic, it's the open AI company. It was supposed to be open. Uh, but your assumption is actually quite well-grounded, and I would actually hypothesize the same thing knowing that they are actually implementing underneath the reinforcement learning algorithms. The question is whether they are giving the high weight to the stoppage when they stop to provide the answer, or they are also depending a lot on whether you like the answer or not, and whether you are reinforcing it. But even if you like it, I talked about the sense-making paradox. If you like the answer, although it's not really a reliable answer, you are still actually feeding it back. And we know how that played also with social media as well. I mean, social media really is having primary, uh, uh, the artifact for or primary objective for them is to optimize for your longer engagement online, more time online. These type of technologies will need to also find the reliable uh, business model. What will be their business model? Maybe to keep you longer there, or maybe, I don't know what's going to be the business model. So I think that's the problematic here as well thing when we come out, uh, when we talk about human knowledge education and these type of technologies because they are convoluted with the business objectives of the organizations that are trying to, to use them. 
I don't know if I answered your question, but I at least provided some speculation. Yeah, thank you, Professor uh, Kisadik, for your sharing. Um, my name is K. Otto from BI. Um, you know, uh, the questions I have is, you know, remains. To what extent can we believe and trust the information uh, generated by chat, GPT, or AI? You know, whether or not they are true, they are or, or not. Or not. Um, I speak for many commoners like us. How do you go about, you mentioned about a lot of um, high level uh, human controls in, is, is, is needed. But then for commoners like us, do we, how can we go about um, understanding whether information generated can be trusted? You know, and, and there, there's so many information out there, you know, and how can we distill, filter? You know, I think this is probably the same as a lot of you guys have, have, have raised. Um, I guess that is a challenge that we're going to face. Look, I think you're asking a really terrific question. The answer I can give you is that we cannot trust it completely. We seem to be basically be always cautiously skeptical about whatever it provides to us. That's number one. And just because of these fundamental things, this example I mentioned from University of Virginia, every single, single student's essay had some level of hallucination. That tells you the kind of the level of prevalence. It could be, we don't even know the estimate how frequently that happens or not. That's really the important critical thing. I have this hypothesis that I think those who know will benefit the most, who are experts on the particular domain topic. Those who don't may be actually in a big trouble or may be lucky and not to be. We also don't know about the social implications of these type of technologies. We know the really deep documentation digital divide. I fear that these type of technologies may perpetuate that digital divide even further. That goes across the socioeconomic uh, levels and then we know other uh, implications and associations of that. So that's my kind of concern about these type of technologies is that we often get these like, you know, fanfare as well from many of these big tech companies, but then eventually boils down to lots of negative implications for certain subgroups in our societies. Um, we have a few questions online, uh, so if I may, I'll read some of them. There are, they're quite big, so maybe you could choose which question you'd like to address before the break. So the first question is, what role do you see AI playing in the future of education? And how do you envision AI being used to enhance the learning experience? Now, the second one. Um, I'm exploring the concept of omnipotence of generative AI. How can we understand its power with considerations of its limitations? And the last one, I think we've already talked about this one. How can we verify whether the information of chat GPT is accurate or not? How reliable it is? Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to just reinforce and go back to also the professor's question um, before. And in terms of verification, current technologies cannot easily verify. They need to have an extra layer that is looking into that. And that requires other types of technologies that exist to a certain extent in artificial intelligence, but they're also built on so-called old school AI as well that I was educated 20 years ago on. But then they are not so scalable as well. So that requires, so people, we are often uh, used to the technologies to use them that are deterministic. We pretty much can know and predict all the outcomes of these type of technologies when we create them as software engineers. But these types of technologies are stochastic. So you cannot really predict what it may spit out. So that's the, really the challenge of behind these type of technologies. With respect to the use of the uh, uh, in learning and teaching, I think I already mentioned some of these examples. I can see really interesting potential for actually pre providing some of these guiding tutors that are available to the students in certain situations. I don't think they will be perfectly replacing the teachers in many cases, because we still need the human connection, right? And I fear that some of these tutors will be helpful for certain types of tasks, but then you actually go back to the, your tutor as well, and they will need to be improved. We also don't have the strong evidence as well that these tutors are available there. We have lots of literature on dialogue-based tutoring based on these old school intelligent tutoring systems as well that could be very powerful, but they had actually lots of domain and pedagogical knowledge embedded in them. I see them also very useful in these so-called formative types of assessments. These assessments 
that are providing feedback and also guiding students to the next task, building the skill. So in a way that are actually, again, extending what is the instructor's reach or teacher's reach, but then trying to help them in many situations. And I think in many of these situations, these type of technologies can be really useful for our professional development. At Stanford, they actually created this GPT Teach, which is used for teacher training and also professional development of their teaching assistment, assess, uh, uh, assistants who are actually chatting with the agents that are based on GPT technology in different types of scenarios, in office hours, in the simulated breakout rooms on Zoom, etc. So in many situations, they are now deploying to more than 800 teachers. So I think there are plenty of these useful, potentially uses, but need to be cautious. The final question was about omnipresence, right? Or omnipotence. I don't even know how to understand that word. It goes beyond my uh, second language vocabulary that I have in English. But it, it, I think in many cases, I, I think it's a really interesting question, right? It goes into much more philosophical questions, right? In many cases, there are these, these debates that I, I'm kind of always on the camp that these type of technologies, although they are powerful, they're not necessarily also so intelligent as well. They need to be prompted, but given their ignorance of the facts of the world, basic structures of the world, the world, et cetera, are also not in many situations so intelligent at all. Um, there's this well-known uh, artificial intelligence researcher who is actually dubbed as one of the three godfathers of the modern artificial intelligence. He is, the, he is a professor with uh, NYU and also chief uh, AI scientist with Meta. Yal Lacoon, and he basically says, before we get human level intelligence, artificial intelligence, we need to get uh, the cat or dog level of intelligence. And in many of these situations, he claims that this level of intelligence now that we have is uh, really at the level of one year old, right? Or even below, below that. However, the problem is not coming from the technology itself, what it can or cannot do, but what kind of attributions we as the society are going to give to these technologies, how much power we are going to delegate to these type of technologies, right? There was an interesting debate about a month ago at the University of Sydney as well, in which it was discussion about how, like, whether large or these like high stake tests are good or not. And the person was saying, well, for the primary purpose, they're good. But the problem is all that secondary, tertiary, and any other purpose that these technologies can be used for that can have lots of detrimental effects and we are actually expecting to be used in so many great things, but they are not going to be used. And so to me, that's the, that kind of fundamental question that needs to be uh, uh, addressed and, uh, and looked into. Thank you. There, there's one more question here and <laughs> maybe we can stop with this one. What sci-fi movies would you say would come true? Uh, I, Robot, Matrix, Terminator, 1984. What movies inspired you when you were young to choose your career path? I, I'd say almost none of these movies uh, inspired me to choose. I was basically always driven for something to do for the people, right? Uh, but, um, which is maybe ironic uh, when we look at some of these technologies. One thing that I, I'm really not good at, I'm not a futurist, I'm not good at prediction. One thing that I regret that I didn't write the written thing 15 years ago, I predicted that we will not know from the video what is true or what is not, what is reality and what is not. And unfortunately, that is coming. And that comes with all the baggage of the good and bad things. I think in many cases, we are talking about dystopian scenarios. I'm less worried in a relatively midterm period that these type of technologies are going to take over the world or the Terminator scenarios. But we are already seeing with the social media that is underpinned with the similar types of AI, what is happening in the world misinformation, disinformation, pitting different groups against each other, etc. And that becomes with generative AI much cheaper, much less expensive. You can actually, you don't have to have like a troll farm anymore. You can just basically have a GPT to generate many of these type of things. That's the dystopian part of the things that I'm concerned about. The more kind of uh, positive type of a thing is that we'll actually potentially start getting much easier access to the information for a range of people who have special needs, people with different types of disabilities as well, 
And to me, that's a really positive thing. We'll also get continue to improve some of the quality of the services. Like, you know, at the moment we all enjoy uh, Google Maps or similar mapping services. It, it's similar, based on similar type of AI technologies. Prediction tasks are always solved. And so I think we'll be getting improvement on that and potentially in certain areas of medicine as well. They'll be done. Uh, some of these matrix type of things are getting probably much more closer to the fruition through the metaverse type of technologies, right? When people are basically just stuck into these virtual spaces and and the, the concern is potentially that we may get stuck too much into these spaces and AI is going to actually be really efficient in doing some of these things inside of it. So we really need to kind of balance our act. We need to have lots of these debates and have both the cultural um, acceptance of certain things uh, also need to have certain level of regulation and also establish the norms as well. What is acceptable and what is not in the end of the day.